Hey everyone, uh, I'm Daniel. I lead the content team at MarkForge. We're a technical team that really works uh, to talk about the products and how they influence the parts we make and do some research into materials and all these kind of interesting things that customers care about. I'd first like to apologize you going to listen to Mark over 20 minutes. You said have to listen to my nasally voice. Uh, but with that, let's get started. Uh, so first, what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to first talk a little bit about thermoplastics generally um, and where they get start, where they got started and kind of how they apply to 3D printing. Then we're going to go into an overview of FFF uh, printing thermoplastics, also known as FDM. Uh, we're going to talk about filled thermoplastics for a bit, which really have taken off in popularity in the last couple of years. And then last, we're going to do a brief foray into continuous fibers and a Q&A. So uh, first, let's start with injection molding. So uh, I, someone asked a question about all 3D printing materials as opposed to just FFF. The reason we're focusing on that is because uh, there's a real clear lineage between injection molding and FFF, and it's the most common, um, and it's kind of the most uh, relatable to understand in a fabrication sense. So with that, injection molding and plastics were invented nearly in parallel. If even if it wasn't a screw-based injection mold, it was maybe a plunger-based one. Uh, they're both invented in the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they've developed together. And so as a result, most plastics that you see today were designed with molding in mind, whether it be injection molding or thermo, uh, thermoset molding or different types of molding. Um, and 3D printing itself was developed in the 1970s and 80s. So historically, it was about 100 years behind plastics. And so as a result, it's not really intuitively part of the space. So a lot of these design constraints and design expectations that have been honed with injection molding in the last 100 years really don't exist in 3D printing. And so as a result, you see some workarounds and hacks that are at the basis of, of especially FFF printing technology. So to kind of look at those in a little bit more detail, first going over injection molding, it's really a high volume process at its core. Uh, you're really not gonna do injection molding until unless you're trying to make hundreds or thousands of units. Injection molding is, as everyone knows, a thin wall process. Injection molded parts are instantly recognizable because of the fact that they have zero walls that are uh, thicker than four millimeters generally, uh, with a few exceptions. As a result, they're very specific in how they're designed and they have a bunch of constraints. Uh, learning to injection mold is an entire class within designing for uh, manufacturing. Um, most injection molded parts are, have low to medium mechanical expectations. That kind of tends to come from two things. One, the most popular injection molded applications are end use parts or tchotchkes or uh, just consumer products. And so these things just don't need to be as strong. They're designed to wear, they're designed to break uh, in time, and they're not really, the durability isn't a major concern. Um, and the second thing is the material properties of most thermoplastics do not really, uh, do not encourage high strength and durable, durable properties. Uh, they sometimes do, but the vast majority do not. And most plastics, as we mentioned before, because they were developed in kind, are moldable. If you're developing a plastic, you really are mostly developing it to be molded. Obviously, there are other ways to fabricate plastic, but molding is far and away the most common. So when you compare that to FFF printing, uh, it, it's really night and day. So FFF printing, because of the way that you're extruding something rather slowly, is a low volume process inherently. In time, it might scale up in volume. We never really know as, as technology scale. But if, it, if it's core, and again, FFF and FDM are the same thing. FDM is a trademark term, so we tend to use FFF in our, um, in our, in our literature. Uh, fused filament fabrication versus fused deposition mo uh, modeling. Um, and so it's a low volume process. Uh, you can have walls of any width technically in a part design, uh, but the way that you do that is having celled infill. So plastics obviously have a lot of thermal expansion and contraction, which leads to warping. With injection molding, they kind of circumvent that with thin walls. With, uh, with uh, 3D printing, they circumvent that with heated beds, like black magic and, um, and celled infill so that your part is mostly hollow in, in most circumstances. You sometimes see parts that are fully thick uh, from an FDM or FFF perspective, but it's, it's rare and those parts are often do not meet dimensional, ac dimensional specifications. Um, generally with 3D printing, because it's a low volume process, you see higher mechanical expectations. The, when you have a low volume manufacturing process, you tend to see it fit more into prototypes and tools and fixtures and, and sometimes low volume and use parts. But the stuff that you're really making with this kind of process tends to really want to be a lot stronger, wants to be more durable, chemically resistant, heat resistant, all these things that really suggest that something would survive in a manufacturing environment. 
And as and the last thing that's that's kind of really important in informing what plastics are printable via FDM or FFF is that few plastics really print natively. A lot of the a lot of the issue with 3D printing is will a plastic print? What conditions in which uh, what conditions are we going to get to print? It's kind of an odd process at its core, and so as a result, you really have to search and find for the plastics that work well. And you'll see that kind of heavily color what plastics are worked on later in the presentation. So if we kind of take the same thing and talk about what materials, you really see the similar things. If you look at the top five injection molding plastics, you'll probably see things you really, you notice, you see a high strength plastic in Delrin, you see ABS, you see polypropylene, which is the most common injection molded plastic, polystyrene, which is the base for a bunch of stuff, including styrofoam and polyethylene, which is all over the place. If you compare that to 3D printing, you really see about one and a half of those compare. So ABS is a very common uh, printing plastic and polyethylene glycol is an, is an adapted version of polyethylene that's kind of different, that's adapted for printing. Uh, but the other three, PLA, nylon, and polycarb, are injection molded to some degree, but they're really not as popular. The, the uh, requirements are different. Um, these ones are more optimized for printing, and they, they generally the material properties are, are optimized for completely different things. So the, the, the process, they're both thermoplastic processes, but a lot of the stuff that actually goes on inside, whether it be process, requirements, or both, really diverges. So now getting into printing thermoplastic. So first I want to talk about how we evaluate thermoplastics in a manufacturing context here. Um, most of y'all know Mark Forge really works, tries to work in through the 3D printing for manufacturing space. So we try to abstract stuff in that respect. Um, and in that respect, there's a few key value drivers. So there's mechanical properties of which there's many, the couple we try to focus that kind of encapsulate the space well are generally strength and stiffness. Um, the, we talk about durability and robustness, where robustness is chemical resistance and heat resistance, how well stuff's going to survive in those environments. And the last one that kind of uh, really is more of a selector in terms of what you should choose from a, like, whitest principle, uh, but you will see it having some effect between thermoplastics themselves is printability and print quality. And so you'll notice that this is a unitless chart. Um, I'll give a lot of credit to 3D Hubs and 3D, uh, 3D Matter um, who kind of sourced this. The reason that we're going unitless is all this stuff is all based in data that we, we collected before. Uh, but the unitless kind of allows you to compare plastics holistically and kind of look at them as a whole and not get stuck on one or two numbers because plastic numbers tend to vary a ton based on the specific composition. Um, and But the general gist of what a plastic is uh, can be relatively easily deduced. And so with that, thermoplastics kind of fit into three groups. They fit into basic thermoplastics. So these plastics are not particularly good at anything. They might be fine. They might work fine, but they're not, they're not especially uh, good at any one thing. You'll see niche thermoplastics, and I, I add a plus because there's some things that are, I would call niche plus thermoplastics. And these are thermoplastics that might have uh, like holes in quality or stiffness or strength, but might be good at one or, two, one or two things, like really good at one or two things, and thus fit for a few applications. And then there's super plastics. Uh, we'll get into Peak and Ultim later, which are the ones that I'll reference first. Um, and these are plastics that are just kind of around the horn, very good plastics, something that you'd be comfortable putting in a manufacturing space, something you feel comfortable like uh, subjecting to load, something that really is, is a plastic, but not in the term, in the kind of this conventional injection molded end use part kind of plastic. So when you look at this a little bit closer, you kind of see two halves to this chart. The top is these visible and tactile attributes. And so what I mean by that is if you print apart and take it off the bed in a material, you can usually sense the top three just by feeling it in your hands uh, and looking at it. And that's kind of a, those are often what 3D printed parts are evaluated on at the, in the early stages. Um, then on the bottom, what you see is that these are more related to success in manufacturing environments. So obviously if your part is not stiff enough to work, it won't work. Uh, but some things you don't see that are a little more under the hood or that kind of come out in time or is your part durable? Is it going to last a lot of cycles? Is it resistant to impact? Is it, uh, is it just generally robust? Is there space under the stress strain curve from a more uh, technical and numerical perspective? And then heat and chemical resistance. Obviously, in most manufacturing environments and in most places where things that aren't plastic exist, there's, there's heat generated. Uh, they're subjected to chemicals. Uh, just over the course of, of wear and tear, these things tend to wear on parts that are not, they're not um, or these parts that are not chemically and heat resistant tend to wear out very quickly. And so with that, we'll get into these basic, the first of the basic thermoplastics, which is PLA. And so uh, the reason we talk about PLA here, even though we don't print PLA as a company and, and uh, we don't kind of endorse printing PLA is that it's really, it's the most common printed thermoplastic. Most people who have printed have printed with PLA. Uh, in this, in this uh, day and age, it's used mostly in hobbyist applications, but as FDM or FFF printing was really taking off in popularity in about 2012, 2013, 2014, 
it was used everywhere. Uh, and almost every engineering team in the country, or many, many engineering teams bought, bought maker bots or bought these hobbyist printers with the intent of printing manufacturing parts. And they were usually printing PLA. And the result of that was, was honestly a, a large setback in the public opinion of 3D printing. And the reason is you can look over the chart. 3D uh, PLA passes the test excellently if you look at the cosmetic properties. Off the bed, it, it's pretty strong and stiff for a printing plastic. It prints very well. That's the reason it's the most popular plastic is that it is it, it has a relatively high print quality. It's pretty robust in printing. Um, but when it comes to being in a manufacturing environment, it's not durable. Uh, it breaks very easily. It, it's, it's, like, it's the only thing I would score is zero out of four for a heat resistant or zero out of four in any category because its heat deflection temperature is, is about the, the heat, the heat like about the temperature of the Sahara Desert. It's, it's like really low. It's about 50 C. And it's not chemically resistant. And so what happens is if you print these kinds of parts and you try to use them in manufacturing or, or more, uh, more abusive environments, they just they fail. And so they might work, they might look good off the bed, but they don't work. And so the, the kind of general industry answer to that for a while has been ABS. And so ABS is less strong and stiff as PLA and it doesn't print as well, um, but it's the most common industrial and industrial in quotes being of the operative thing, uh, printing plastic. It's more durable, it's moderately heat resistant, uh, but it has really no chemical resistance, which is killer for most manufacturing environments. And it's uh, it's just only a moderate plastic. You, it does everything okay. And so you will see ABS in manufacturing environments. It works all right. Some high-grade ABSs are actually okay to use, but for the most part, it's just not something you really want to work with. And the last of these basic plastics is PETG. It was the other one of the two on the five most common uh, that was in common with injection molding. It shares a lot of properties with ABS and PLA. It's a little stronger and it's a little more well-rounded than, it's a little stronger than ABS and it's a little more well-rounded than PLA. So of the three, uh, if you can print PETG, it's a little bit more, uh, it's more of a rare uh, printing plastic. It's not a bad one to print. Uh, but again, these are all just kind of basic thermal plastics. And you'll, you'll see as we get deeper in this presentation that, that these might be okay for a manufacturing environment, but okay is likely not good enough when you have other things available to you. So niche and niche plus thermoplastics. The quintessential one is a TPU or TPE, or you'll see a proprietary name being Ninja Flex or just flexible filament. Uh, these are these filaments that, that are in, insanely flexible. They're, they're, they have negative stiffness, essentially. Uh, they're not particularly strong, but they're super durable because of how uh, flexible they are. They're, you, they're really good in niche applications. So if you wanna, if you wanna make something, 3D print something that, that is flexible, you use something like this. Um, personally, I wouldn't. I I think that their print quality is so low that you uh, they're often not usable. And in fact, it's easier to just three D print a a mold for a different polymer and just cast the polymer. Um, but either way is viable, and this is definitely a niche plastic that that, that is used. The second one, and this is really a great plastic. Though, uh, this is is polycarbonate. Uh, it's super strong and stiff. Uh, overall, it's a great plastic. It's it's it has excellent heat resistance. It resists chemicals. It's pretty durable. The big knock on, on polycarbonate as a plastic, the reason that it's not used more heavily, it's, it's very difficult to print and few systems print polycarb. Um, because of its, it is a high melting temperature, uh, you really need a heated environment for it not to warp drastically as you're printing. And so the systems that can print polycarb are generally very expensive industrial systems. And if you're gonna spend that much money on a system, you probably don't want it to just print a thermoplastic. And so as a result, you'll see it. It's a great material in, in practice if you can get it printed, but it's just not something that prints super often. And the last of these is nylon. And nylon is kind of the most unique of these first, uh, these first six plastics because it has best-in-class chemical resistance. It's, it's inert relative to chemicals. If you put it in a manufacturing environment, it will not fail because, uh, because of chemicals exposed. The problem with nylon is that a lot of other things are poor. It's a durable plastic, which is excellent, uh, and it prints moderately well but it's not strong and it's just not stiff. And no, one, no one's ever gone to a general nylon and been uh, expecting a stiff plastic. It's just not what it is. And that stiff, that lack of stiffness and that lack of strength, uh, generally uh, these flexible filaments don't perform super well in heat resistance tests because they're already flexible. And so the moment you heat them up even a little bit, uh, it's not, it's not going to perform super well. So it's, it's a plastic that has a bunch of potential and really like two of the three for manufacturing environments are very checked out, but it's not something you use by itself. And so last of these, I'm going to talk about one or two super plastics that I've kind of blend in, blended into one slide to not go too deep into them. 
peak and ultim. And so these, these plastics are super high grade. Uh, you'll notice they do a ton of things well. Everything they, they print all right, but they do everything else very well. And when you look at a plastic like this, it's chemically resistant. It's heat resistant to like 200 degrees Celsius plus, which is uh, unbelievable. It's super durable. It's super strong and it's pretty stiff. And so these are the kind of plastics you'll see in, in actual manufacturing plants as is. Currently, the main way to do it is you, you might injection mold them, but you're more likely to machine them out of a block. They're machinable plastics that that you'll see um, all over the place. And so in a manufacturing environment, this is kind of what you're looking for. Unfortunately, Peak and Ultim are both very expensive. Um, and to 3D print them, again, it's like some, it's generally requirements are such that you need an industrial grade printer. And by industrial grade, I don't mean like... Uh, high quality i mean something that someone's going to mark up to two three hundred thousand dollars to even get you started in these kind of things so they're, they're great they're they're inaccessible and that's the big problem so that really brings us to filled thermoplastics so three or four years ago people kind of realized that this this kind of spread was was really apparent that you saw the, these basic plastics aren't really good for anything these niche ones that are kind of good for some stuff and these super plastics that are that are great but they're not really usable in a wide sense in a wide enough sense and they're not accessible so what is a filled thermoplastic? Uh, you have to excuse this like PowerPoint drawing, but I think it does a pretty good job kind of describing it. A thermoplastic is still a plastic. So uh, that's really the most important thing to know. It's a conventional plastic and it's partially composed of tiny particles of a second material. You're just blending materials. Uh, and the second material concentration can vary from like 0% to however much percent, how, whatever high, height percent you can physically print something with. It can be 35, 40, 50% in that range. Um, but again, it's still a plastic, it's an augmented plastic. Uh, and so you'll see in a lot of marketing materials uh, and a lot of uh, like promises associated with people printing composites, they're really printing filled thermoplastics. And so, but why, they're still great. So why would you fill a thermoplastic? So carbon fiber and fiberglass being the two main ones, but a lot of other materials have far superior material properties to thermoplastics. Uh, you can't, you obviously can't just make, make something just a big block of carbon fiber or a big block of fiberglass, but individually in tiny quantities, they're very strong. So add these tiny particles of strong material to a plastic matrix, it can augment the material properties. And so you'll see generally strength and stiffness and durability and in some respects, print quality will go up as well, depending on what you're doing. Um, and filled plastics are not at all new. So Obviously, people, a lot of people are trumpeting them as, as things that are like the, the, the cutting edge. But Bakelite, which is one of the first uh, like industrial thermoplastics, was a wood-based polymer that had wood grains in it. And this was in 1910. So, so filled thermoplastics are nothing new. Uh, the way that they're being applied now in 3D printing is new. Um, and so how are they being applied in printing? So really, you'll see two types. You'll see these bespoke hobbyist materials. And so these are the kind of things you'll see on Matter Hackers or, or uh, just general filament sites that you're, you're seeing for hobbyists. And you'll like see wood filaments and coffee filaments and metal powders inside a filament that you can print out of your hobbyist printer. And these are cool. I mean, they may augment the properties, but they're not useful in a manufacturing sense. And they kind of pollute the space. And then you see fiber-filled plastic. And so these are almost always filled with, again, fiberglass and carbon fiber. Nylon is far and away the most common filled. You'll also see PLA and ABS filled. There is a reason why nylon is filled, which we'll get into in a second. And of those three, of, the, of all those types, carbon fiber filled nylon is the most common and the one that's really exploded over the last couple of years. So Mark Forge, uh, we have a material called Onyx. It's our black thermoplastic. It is a carbon fiber filled nylon. Uh, you'll see like a bunch of other companies, whether it be filament manufacturers or 3D printer manufacturers have also shipped things like this in the last couple of years. Um, and we'll kind of get into those now. So why would you do this? Uh, from like a, the, the, all, obviously we're talking a lot about this, but how does this affect the material properties? So remember nylon. So nylon's really interesting. Again, it prints all right. It's sort of strong. It, it's really quite durable and it has good chemical resistance, but it's, it's really not super usable in a lot of respects. When you put nylon, when you put carbon fiber in nylon, when you put chopped carbon fiber in nylon at a certain percentage, you get a part like, you get a thing like this. So all of a sudden, the uh, going around the horn, uh, obviously carbon fiber inside nylon makes it stronger. It, it makes it way stiffer. It doesn't change the durability all that much. Nylon's durability more uh, comes from its ability to elongate. And so uh, it doesn't change that that much. It really boosts the heat resistance a ton because then you're really changing your thermal expansion and you're having a part that's more structurally sound. It maintains its chemical resistance. And the biggest, uh, the most interesting jump is in print quality. So uh, nylon as material, as many materials are, has a warping problem. And so if you've ever 3D printed, you know warping is, is, a, is a big deal. Uh, part shrinkage is a big deal. And dimensional accuracy is a big deal. Uh, when you put these, these, par uh, these particles in a part to a certain degree, 
again, to a certain degree, uh, it really limits that thermal, uh, that thermal expansion and contraction that happens and your warping tends to disappear and your departs to be more accurate and your smaller features tend to hold up better. And so really this is by all and for all intents, a super plastic. Um, and again, I don't know, there's an error on the slide. It says niche plus, it's a super plastic. Oh, actually. So going through, it's a plastic that is now chemically resistant. It prints better than thermoplastics. It has good heat resistance and it has high strength and stiffness. And it's not a niche plus thermoplastic anymore. It's a super plastic. And so those are really the key things that, that, uh, that involve carbon fiber and nylon. Um, but as I said, concentrations tend to vary. So uh, does increasing the fill concentration to a critical degree continue to improve parts? Well, the answer is yes and no. So uh, let's look at what happens when you put, uh, as opposed to a lower percent of carbon fiber, a much higher percent. So you're putting in as much carbon fiber as you can physically print. Uh, because at some point you're heating up plastic and putting it out of a nozzle uh, and you have to have something that melts and goes through the nozzle. So there's, there's an upper limit. But if you, if you kind of push towards that upper limit, something interesting happens. So your parts get stronger and stiffer. So again, there's nylon, nylon against it. They stay about the same durability and heat resistance and chemical resistance, um, but their print quality goes way down because again, you're still printing a thermoplastic. The part is still primarily thermoplastic. So if you try to take too much thermoplastic out of that part, what happens is the part gets rough, the part string, uh, and while they might not have that thermal quality, all of a sudden your part is not plastic enough to really be extruded out of the nozzle. So your print quality goes to, goes to one. If you look at a lot of parts that are overfilled with carbon fiber and nylon, they, they just don't look good. Um, and that's, that's a really big problem because uh, obviously cosmetic, part things, cosmetic parts are something, um, are one thing, but when your parts are cosmetically poor, it also kind of suggests they're dim dimensionally inaccurate. Um, they, they are often more dangerous to deal with because the carbon fiber will slough off in your hands if you overfill them. And there's all kinds of things that, that, that kind of come up as a negative. So it's, 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 a, it's a great plastic. You could, you could argue it's a super plastic, but in reality, when you overfill it, it starts to go to a niche plus plastic because whether or not something is 3D printable is really the, the key um, as, to what, as, to, as to why whether or not to use it. If you can't print it, it's, it's just uh, it's like a non-starter. And so that's what you see when it happens when you overfill it. And then we kind of, at Mark Forge, we kind of asked the question here in this last little thing, uh, what if strength and quality don't have to be a straight off? And so the way that we do it here at our company is continuous fiber. So we, um, so what we do is we use this process called CFF. And so if you look at this graphic on the left, the right is a, is kind of the thermoplastic matrix in our, in our, um, in our case, it's a chopped carbon fiber reinforced nylon. And the left, you see a, like continuous strands of carbon fiber. And so those long strand composites are not chopped. They're, they're, they're obviously, they're like one strand per layer of a part. And most importantly, they can be used together. So, so a chopped carbon fiber filled nylon and a continuous carbon fiber can be used together in a part. And these parts massively, the continuous fiber massively boosts the mechanical properties of this part without sacrificing the print quality. And that's really important because now all of a sudden, what happens is you can do this. So now you have in the middle, you have your nylon and the, in the orange, you have uh, basically a, a chopped carbon fiber filled nylon, pretty similar to the one we use. And then in that darker blue, you see what happens when you add fibers. And to be quite honest, I think we may have underrated this, the qualities of these fibers because I didn't have enough space in the slide to make the hexagon as big as it should have been. But what happens is your strength and stiffness go through the roof. So all of a sudden, those small strength and stiffness buffs that you get from overfilling carbon fiber at expensive print quality seem rather meaningless. So we, we use our fiber-filled nylon for its, its generally excellent qualities, it, it, and especially that it prints very well. That's really important in a manufacturing capability and any capability. If your part doesn't print well, again, it's not, it's not, it's not a part. And the fiber filling then takes those material properties that you could augment by overfilling a part and pushes them to pushes them to like 400% of anything else. So just for reference, like the strength of uh, this, this, the stiffness of um, the flexural stiffness of an overfilled part might be about 10 gigapascals and the, uh, the flexural stiffness of a carbon fiber reinforced part is about 60. So it's, it's not quite an order of magnitude, but it's, it's a whole different ball game. And you're doing that without sacrificing print quality. So that's really when you talk about continuous fiber, that's kind of why we do it and how it fits into this continuous versus chop versus thermoplastic space. And with that, um, I'll open up to questions. I will say uh, my colleague Alex Kreese is doing a webinar in about a week or two. I'm not exactly sure of the date. Uh, Marco will send it out soon about fiber reinforcement, the stuff we just talked about at the very end, the basics of it, the strategies, again, a little bit more into why it's good um, and what, what really matters. And yeah, I thank you guys for your time today and open up to questions.
So now's the time if you have any questions to open the Q&A window in your interface and enter your questions there. Um, I'd also like to mention that if you have not had the opportunity to actually feel uh, one of our parts, whether it's at a trade show or at some other opportunity, uh, if you go to our website, markforge.com, right on the homepage, you'll be able to actually request a sample part. And when you fill out that form, we will actually send you uh, two parts. One is just a plain nylon part, and the other part will be a uh, the same part printed in Onyx, which is our... Uh, carbon fiber filled nylon with continuous carbon fiber in it. So you can actually have those parts in your hands and compare them uh, in person. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, all right. So I see we have questions coming in, Daniel. All right, let's do it. <laughs> the zoom question interface is always fun, but we'll go from the, we'll go from the first asked. So first someone asked the parameters of printing nylon. So nylon actually for its like low heat deflection temperature has a high melting temperature. So you have to print it hot, which is part of the reason it warps so poorly. Um, someone asked how you quantify durability, heat, and chemical resistance. I got into durability a little bit. Um, I believe durability, I would say, is a, is a kind of a composite rating, uh, uh, ironically, of a few things. So one is your IZOD impact rating. Two is uh, durability can be in toughness. Uh, you choose your toughness, which in a quantifiable sense is the area under the curve, the stress strain curve. Uh, three is basically like uh, cycle testing, imp like uh, testing over time over that. And those are kind of the three main ones. Um, and heat, heat resistance, there's, uh, there's ASTM tests. I believe they do it at 66 and 264 PSI and they check when your beam bends. I think those are the technical, uh, those are the technical two main tests you'll see. For these ones, I use the data from the 66 PSI test, which is the industry standard. Uh, so what are the experimental conditions for adding fiber to nylon? Uh, honestly, most, most suppliers do it themselves. Uh, can this material be chrome plated? Yes, it can. Uh, sorry, this is refreshing very awkwardly. Um, how long would it take to build a maximum size item during CFF? So again, 3D printing is slow. So uh, our, biggest print, our biggest printer is 13 inches by 10 inches by nine or like three, uh, I would say 330 by 250 by 210 about in millimeters. And so if you wanted to print a full volume material with fiber, it might take a month. But uh, in reality, most of the parts that we have, we see print between in between about 10, 12 hours and two, three days if they're a big one. Um, and the other thing is you really to get the strength of the continuous fiber, you don't need to fill it entirely with fiber. Uh, even a few, even like a few of, uh, select layers of fiber can really add a significant amount of strength to your part. Um, so someone asked, they got the sample in the mail, is the Onyx sample a hollow matrix just like the clear nylon piece? So this gets a little bit more into the details of the fiber. So I, um, I would definitely encourage you to uh, attend the next webinar to look, learn in detail about this. What I'll say is this. So with the way that it works is, as we said, and most, ever, most FDM processes have a hollow cell infill basis. Uh, so that means that basically in our case, what we do is we print walls, walls floors, and roofs. And we print triangular cells in the middle. What we do when we put the fiber in is we replace those triangular parts of those triangular cells and the layers that we're doing it with continuous fiber. So if you filled a part continue, uh, with, uh, fully with continuous fiber, which is possible, uh, you would have virtually none of that hollow infill. Uh, that being said, we don't recommend that people fill parts all the way. I just, uh, you don't need to usually. So it, it does have, it is partially infilled, but not all the way. Someone asked how we deal with the anisotropic properties in the nylon filled material. Um, so it's for, for reference, uh, it's about 60 and 60 to 70% as strong in Z as it is in X and Y in, in tension. Uh, it's a little different than say uh, PET G, which is kind of the standard bearer and that it's almost as strong in Z. There's some materials that are pretty isotropic. Um, I would say a couple of things in response to that. Uh, in terms of dealing with, there's a few ways you could deal with it. So one, uh, most even even in a part that is theoretically isotropic, um, the celled infill that pretty much everyone prints with uh, in an FDM process uh, is basically means a part's anisotropic just because of the volume in the area. Um, it's, it's no longer a solid part. Uh, in the case of us, our parts are especially anisotropic because the fiber reinforcement is in uh, two planes. So uh, we're, we're the first to admit that our parts, while well, they're super strong and basically X and Y tension and then every type of bending, uh, they're weak in Z tension. And so 
uh, if you look at the resources on the website and the webinars we do and we talk about, uh, especially I can believe the next one as well, I don't want to shamelessly plug it, uh, we'll talk a lot about how you circumvent that. We don't really try to hide the fact that our parts don't have a high, high Z strength. We really say, look, this is a design, this is a design paradigm like any other. Uh, you, can, you can design around it rather easily. We've been doing it for a number of years and here's how you do it. Cool. Um, so can we compare different fibers for cost and performance? Uh, yeah, so actually we're shipping out a new materials section on our website in the next couple of weeks, which I would heavily encourage you to visit when it comes out. Uh, there will also be a webinar in October where we compare each fibers, each fiber as such. It, it'll be a pretty good one. I don't know the exact, or sorry, not November. Um, we, it'll be a good one to attend if you're curious about how these things use. I personally believe that we kind of, uh, we don't actually do a great job talking about differentiations. And as a result, people tend to go for the normal flashy name plastics, so the, the flashy name fibers instead of the ones that I think are really interesting. Um, let's see, take uh, maybe four or five more questions. Um, so as filled or reinforced parts get held by plastic, how does the temperature bearability get enhanced? Um, so this is, it's actually an interesting question. So the reason it is because uh, when you're, when, you're, when you're talking about the temperature deflections of plastics, just like metals, they are far below the melting point. So uh, for example, nylon prints, prints in like the 280 degrees Celsius range, but it deflects at like 40, 50, 60, depending on what you're talking about. So really what happens is when you heat, a, when you heat an all plastic part, that plastic denatures to some degree, it loosens up, and that's when the material properties go. So even though a plastic isn't melted, it's not a pool of molten plastic, it is functionally useless. So what the fibers do is uh, continuous fibers and shop fibers do not melt. They don't, they don't melt. Their melting temperature is an order of magnitude higher than, than what you see with plastic. So when you put something in there like that, uh, all of a sudden your part becomes more st uh, sturdy. And so that doesn't mean these fiber reinforced parts don't weaken as, as the temperature gets hotter. It means they weaken at a much slower rate, whether that be the chop fiber, which to some degree weakens, or the continuous fiber. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of why. Why is the filament so hygroscopic? Because nylon is hygroscopic. Uh, what are the properties of onyx? I would encourage you to look at our data sheet online. Uh, you can look. Uh, what temperature is CFF nylon printed at? Uh, Again, it's pretty similar to nylon. It's in like, I think it's like the 275 range. Uh, is delamination between the fiber and nylon matrix a problem? Uh, I think when we first launched as a product five years ago, maybe, uh, over the years, we've really done a lot of software optimization to talk to, to make sure that the parts that we're printing are printing at a high quality, to make sure that they print really well, to make sure that they don't delaminate. Um, that being said, again, if you pull apart and see, it is not, uh, it is not harnessing the strength of continuous fiber. So it's more likely to delaminate in that sense. Um, how much finishing do parts need to go into their final sizes and tolerances? So in the XY plane, we hold about a 5 thou or a 125 micron tolerance pretty consistently. If you're trying to do like a hole in the ZX plane or the ZY plane, so a vertical plane, it tends to be a little bit um, ovalish. That's just, uh, ours, uh, it's just how uh, FDM technology tends to work. Um, let's see. How do we control our 3D printing toolpath using your printers? Um, so we have a software that is actually actually free to sign up for. So if you go to iger.io, you can sign up for it and check it out. Um, our software, uh, basically you upload an STL, it does all the pathing for you, it loads it to your printer, it's all cloud connected. It's a really awesome process. Um, to use a hardened nozzle to cope with fiberware, I would definitely recommend using a hardened nozzle. If you're a hobbyist looking into it, your uh, fiber, if you buy a fiber filament and you put it on a normal nozzle, it'll rip it apart instantly. Um, we obviously do use hardened, a specialized nozzle. I'm not gonna talk about specific, the specifics of the nozzle, but yeah, we do. Um, how much fiber percent can be achieved in a printed part? And what is the raster angle of printing? Same effect on strength. So I'm going to assume, I'm, I'll address this from the chopped and the continuous side. From the chopped side, I don't know what the maximum fiber percent, I would suppose it wouldn't be much, much more than 50% by volume. Uh, with a continuous fiber by volume, it, it depends. So that we print our continuous fibers. They're coated in a little plastic and we kind of iron them down onto the part. And so as a result, the, the fiber material itself isn't 100% fiber, but you can fill a part almost 100% with that fiber material. Um, how much longer does it take to design a fiber reinforced part? Like maybe two minutes. So the, the design of the STL will, or the SOLIDWORKS part or the Fusion part or whatever you're using does not change at all. Uh, our software takes care of it. So when you go into our software, again, I try out iger.io if you get a chance. Uh, you can basically upload your STL. You then decide if you want fiber in the part. That's just a yes or no. It'll automatically put fiber in in a specific orientation, which we, uh, I'm sure Alex will talk about in our next webinar in the end of October. 
uh, and then you can adjust it in a secondary screen. So if you wanted, you could probably spend three hours optimizing everything. I think to get a suitable amount of fiber reinforcement, I've rarely taken more than five minutes. Do we have a materials cost uh, cost comparison visual? Um, not here on, on this chart. I can tell you that the ballparks, um, our fibers are about, I th they're somewhere in the 70 to $120 per 50 cubic centimeter range. Uh, and that's, that, that tends to last a long time. Our thermoplastics are about $170, $180 for 800 cubic centimeters. So uh, when we talk about part cost in our sense, we tend to talk about it more as a comparison to machine parts or uh, that, are, that kind of part as opposed to a hobbyist part just because of the applications we tend to be replacing. Uh, if you want to look at just general costs of parts and how we compare, we have a bunch of case studies on our site. I would recommend looking at those and that can maybe both give you a sense of how much our parts cost and how much we tend to save. Um, someone asked if we print parts as a service. Uh, we do not. There are services out there that print our parts. Uh, so if you look up, I think 3D Hubs and Shapeways both have printers that use us. I would heavily encourage if you're looking for more than even a few parts, uh, look at our printers. We definitely uh, see a record of our printers paying themselves off very quickly and people kind of being surprised at the applications they can use them for. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that's just about all the questions. If we missed yours, I'm very sorry. It looks like most of them we got answered. Um, yeah. And again, thank you so much for listening. We have another webinar at the end of October. We tend to do about two a month. Uh, and if you found this valuable, just let, please let us know. Um, yeah. Uh, have a nice day, all. Yep. And I'd also like to mention uh, a few things that we touched upon in the Q&A today. Uh, if you want to actually upload your own parts and play around with uh, reinforcing them with fiber, if you visit us at markforge.com, you can actually sign up for a trial of our software. Uh, the trial is completely unlimited. You can use it as long as you want. Um, and you can play around with it to your heart's content, upload any sort of file you want, any part you want, uh, and see for yourself uh, just how straightforward it is to actually uh, use the fiber reinforcement techniques in our slicer. Um, you can also, as I mentioned earlier, request sample parts for yourself. This is, again, totally free. Just go on to markforge.com. Right on the homepage, there's a big button to do so, and we will mail you samples of the parts that we've discussed today. Uh, also, as mentioned, we have a wealth of data sheets. Um, Daniel is exceptionally knowledgeable. I love having him as a presenter, but if you want to peruse all this data for yourself uh, at your uh, leisure, you can do so with our data sheets, which cover everything from various material specifications to the specifications of the printers uh, themselves. And finally, if you want to go uh, more in depth, if you want to uh, discuss your specific applications, so if you know, hey, this seems like it could be something I could take advantage of uh, in my manufacturing facility or uh, in my company, you can contact us on the website and set up a, uh, a demonstration or a consultation, uh, which is a 10, 15 minute individualized webinar, one-on-one -on -one, where product specialists will discuss your application uh, with you and, and cover exactly how some of our technology uh, can help uh, in your situation. I just realized I missed like two questions because the scrolling. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just quickly address them. Someone asked about moisture impact of printed parts. Uh, so after you print it, the hygroscopic, it doesn't really matter in the context of it. It does affect it. It's still hygroscopic. It doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Someone asked why the bed size isn't, uh, isn't uh, a meter squared, uh, a meter cubed, uh, probably because we're extruding filament at, at a much narrower rate. Uh, those meter by meter by meter things make things very quick and very dirty, and uh, they're, they're not precise at all. Someone asked, uh, if the printing is 2.5D, again, I kind of answered that. Yes, it is. Uh, the reason being that you, you laid on fiber and plastics in an XY plane. Um, and To all the folks who are asking uh, yeah. about the, a copy of the presentation or recording, we have been recording today's webinar. Uh, it takes us about a day to take the recording and, and put it on the website, but we will be emailing everyone who attended today and everyone who registered a copy of today's recorded webinar uh, sometime tomorrow morning. So uh, look, look forward to that in your inbox. Uh, and I think uh, with that, uh, Daniel, I would like to thank you for attending today. Uh, you've been a great audience uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks guys.